YouTube is live. There's the shot right there. Okay. okay. So center camera is what we're talking to? Is this one right here. It's red, so it's recording. Okay. And having done this for 15 years, if you don't have multiple redundancy, something always goes wrong. And that one worked. So, and I'm going to be moving around here. Ignore me. Uh, I'm just making sure everything's going. Okay, so you want us to start? Oh, one second. I just want to make sure this is recording. There we go. In three, and two, and one. Welcome. My name is John Tucker, uh, CEO of Mount San Rafael Hospital in Trinidad, Colorado. I want to thank Trinidad TV for uh, providing this format to uh, allow us to ask, some, ask and answer some questions about the COVID uh, pandemic in our community and country. Uh, I want to introduce the folks we've got here with us today. To my left is Kim Lucero, our Director of Planning and Development, Mandy Schaefer, the Chief Nursing Officer at our, at our hospital, and Dr. June Flores, a physician and pediatrician at our hospital. Uh, so welcome. We've got a few questions, uh, sort of uh, canned questions we're going to start to run through and that may spark some additional uh, thoughts and discussion at the table. Um, so Mandy, do you want to start with your first uh, kind of topic, hospital update impact on our community? Sure. There's been um, a lot of changes uh, going on both internally and with our community as far as changes due to the COVID-19 virus. Um, first of all, in our community, we are working hard to daily communicate with phone calls and updates as far as working with our partners in the community, the health department, our law enforcement, our schools, and just making sure that everyone um, is on the same page and up to date with local information. Internally, we have a lot of changes as far as uh, our physical environment and our operations in the hospital. Things that would be noticeable to the community would be um, we have suspended our elective surgeries, we're restricting visitors, uh, we screen all patients and, and visitors at the door at any entry point on our campus, whether it be the clinic or the hospital. And we've initiated a lot of teleclinic visits. Our providers have done a very good job at maintaining access to their patients, um, even though they should be staying at home. So through telemedicine, um, we're able to do uh, visits right now via FaceTime or Skype. So talk to us a little bit about the testing process. I know we hear a lot on the news about testing generally, but I think folks don't know how it works. Who gets tested, who doesn't get tested, how, how does all that work? Sure, well there's criteria that the CDPHE, or our state health department, puts out that uh, gives us some guidance as far as who should be tested and who shouldn't. Those have changed a little bit in the last couple weeks. We stay up to date on those, and I think the most important thing for community members to remember is that it does require a physician's order to be tested. So if you think you have symptoms and you need to be tested, we would ask that you would first contact your medical provider for, for guidance. And if they decide you need that order, we've arranged um, safe ways for you to be able to get that order um, filled and get that testing completed uh, through a process that doesn't necessarily have you coming inside our facility, but maybe a safer way that involves staff coming out to your vehicle or to an uh, outside area that's been cordoned off. Uh, Dr. Flores, speaking a little bit to exposure and risk factors, how do people keep from exposing others if they think they're sick? How do they prevent catching COVID-19 if they think they've been exposed? So pretty much, as we know, with COVID-19, the symptoms can be from mild to severe. If you have mild symptoms, just like fever and cough, then your doctor might tell you just stay at home. If you're staying home, make sure you practice home isolation. That's the key you have to stay away from others as much as possible, okay? If there's such like a room where you could specifically assign it as like a sick room, try to stay there and keep distance from the rest of the family members. If you have a face mask available, it would be nice for the sick person to wear a mask, especially if you're around the other healthy members of the family. Another important thing to do for the sick person so you don't spread it for the rest of the family members, cough and sneeze, basically you cover your mouth and your nose with your tissue, okay, and dispose properly. And another important thing will be hand washing. With hand washing, you do it properly at least 20 seconds with your soap and water. Or you could use hand sanitizers, which would have at least 60% of alcohol in it. Another thing that's important to do will be avoid touching your eyes, 
nose, mouth without hand washing, especially if you have a family member who's sick. Make sure you wash hands first before you touch any part of your face. Another thing, you should avoid sharing personal household items. That's very important. Those dishes, drinking glasses, cups, eating utensils. Try to avoid sharing and make sure those are washed properly. And another thing, always clean and disinfect your house. That's another important thing to do. And last but not the least, most important actually for everyone is to stay home. Okay? Staying home so that you don't get exposed to the COVID-19 virus. Mandy, kind of going off script a little bit, can you kind of talk a little bit about, there's lots of confusion I think in the community about mask wearing and what a surgical mask does and what its purpose is and what a respirator and N95 mask does and what its purpose is. Can you talk about those two things? Sure. What you see most commonly is what we call a standard surgical mask. And that is what you would see if you came into our facility as a patient and you were having symptoms such as fever and cough. In order to protect the rest of the staff and the public around you, we would give you a standard surgical mask. The purpose of that mask is actually to protect the droplets um, coming from the person who is ill from infecting others. So wearing a mask if you're not ill doesn't necessarily protect you um, in that situation. The masks that we wear for personal protection are the N95 masks. Looks a little bit like a duck bill. Looks a little bit like a duck bill. Some of them come with a small filter on the outside of them. They can be interchanged. And those come with um, a little more responsibility to wearing them. It's actually required that facilities like ours have um, respiratory protocols that follow OSHA guidelines that require fit testing to make sure those masks fit staff members properly because if they don't fit you properly, they aren't working properly. And those are the masks that you will see healthcare providers use if you were to come in for testing or if you were a suspected COVID-19 patient, you would see staff members wearing those masks because it protects us what we call full airborne, airborne precautions. Um, so staff members that are collecting swabs, that are physicians who are examining patients' throats and mouths, um, they would wear that in order to protect themselves even though they are not sick. And Dr. Flores, can you kind of explain the difference between isolation and quarantine? I think the general public hears that and they think those are essentially the same. So when we talk about like isolation, it means you separate the sick people from those who are not sick. When you say quarantine, it means that you try to separate those who have been exposed to contagious disease to see if they will become sick. So isolate those who are sick, quarantine if you got exposed, and watch you if you have any symptoms to develop. Right. And this question may be for Mandy or Dr. Flores. What would uh, make somebody considered at high risk? You know, we, we hear a lot on, from the governor about vulnerable populations and folks that are more at risk to this, um, this virus and, and some bad outcomes from this virus versus others. Um, I can answer that as far as um, how the CDC defines that. And those are the, that's the website, the Centers for Disease Control, that is uh, making recommendations nationally um, that state um, health departments also follow. Uh, they define that as uh, people who have either an age of 65 or older, um, persons of any age that have a chronic medical disease or condition. An example of some of those would be someone with uncontrolled diabetes, someone with uh, lung disease like COPD or asthma. And anybody who has cancer or is considered immunocompromised, those patients are considered high-risk population and at more risk for the disease or, or difficulties if, if they um, contract the disease. Uh, so what if someone is, is not at higher risk, maybe like any one of us, but still needs medical advice? What would you direct that person to do? Pretty much someone who is not at high risk but still needs medical advice, the key is always talk or be in contact with your physician, with your doctor, okay? Keep in touch with your doctor, that's the most important thing. And to let everyone know, again, for COVID-19, everyone is at risk of getting the infection. It's just your risk of getting mild versus severe varies. So don't be so confident that you could go out because you won't get ill. You could get sick with this and you could spread it to those people with high risk. And to, to add, uh, John, because a while ago you asked me about to differentiate quarantine versus isolation. Um, people wonder why or for how long they're supposed to be quarantined, right? Again, 
When we say that you're supposed to quarantine yourself, you're supposed to quarantine for 14 days. Yes, 14 days. Why? It's because those symptoms of COVID may appear 2 to 14 days from the day that you got exposed. Uh, so, kind of on that note, uh, can we give a reminder about that we've got folks, man, clinicians manning the phones at both the hospital and the clinic? Do we have numbers we need to give? Um, sure, I can share those numbers, John. So, um, our clinic number, which um, they, you can call and speak to the operator and they can get you in touch with um, our triage nurse, is 719-846-2206. And they can definitely assist you on um, talking with you over your symptoms, whether you should be seen in the clinic or not, and what you should do to seek further care. Uh, Mandy, why don't you tackle this one? What, what should someone do if they are experiencing a medical emergency? Just like any other situation when, when folks are very sick, feel like they need hospital care, sure. what do they do? Um, you know. The only difference at this point is that we do ask if people are able to is to call first. Um, if you think you have COVID virus symptoms um, and you need an ambulance and need to call 911, it would be good to let them know that you think you have those symptoms so that EMS can prepare for that and they can in turn let the hospital know before arrival and staff can be ready to appropriately protect themselves and other patients uh, when they arrive. If you need to come straight to the emergency room, um, that can still be done. Uh, we are screening everybody at entry points, but it would not delay care, and we will still see anybody with an emergent condition. There might just be a very short uh, prompt screening as they arrive. We have a couple of other things on our campus that I would also like to mention. Uh, for people that might be in need of their medical records or to pay a bill, you can always pay your bill online. Um, if you're in need of medical records, if you call our medical records department, um, they will assist you with, um, you can make an email request, you can do it through the mail, and um, it just makes it easier. So you may, you may not want to come to our facility for medical records at this particular point in time, but we can definitely help you with that. General number to call for the hospital to be directed to the medical records department would be 719-846-9213, and they will assist you with that process. Uh, bill pay, once again, can be done through our website, and also, if you come in through our professional complex um, on our campus, you can go ahead and just drop that bill um, at our screening point when you come into that facility. A couple other pieces of information at our website, msrhc.org. There's links to CDPHE, which is the Colorado Department of Health and Environment, and the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, uh, have lots of good information and up-to-date information on statistics. Uh, and treatment suggestions related to COVID-19. Um, if, if we don't have anything else, I want to thank everybody for being here today, our excellent staff at the hospital who stands prepared to, uh, to, to be of assistance to our community, however this uh, pandemic uh, results in, our, in the coming weeks and months. Um, and don't, don't hesitate to reach out, reach out to anybody at our hospital for help. Thank you very much. Also do here in a day or two is um, if you